Good. Well, thanks to Tony for organizing this. Um, I think um, instead of uh, talking specifically about a research topic like personality or even generalist genes, I thought I would follow up a bit more on what Tim was talking about, which was really the usefulness of behavioral genetic methods for understanding behavior. And instead of focusing on methods, I thought I'd just talk about some of the results, I think, that we have, important findings in the behavioral sciences that have come from behavioral genetics. And one of those that interests me a lot is generalist genes. But I thought instead I would cheat, and because I know the first two talked about 20 minutes, and we, we're trying to get down more to 10 minutes. So I'll give a briefer talk that's basically a taster of my talk this afternoon, because it does, uh, these do tie in together. As Tim was suggesting, people are saying, why do behavioral genetics, it's old fashioned or whatever. And I'd like to argue instead that most of what we know about the genetics and behavior comes from quantitative genetics. And what we're learning from molecular genetics gives us real pause as to whether or not that's going to be all of genetics in the future. And when people say behavioral genetics, by the way, I really think it's important to say it's the genetics of behavior. That's whether it's quantitative genetics or molecular genetics. So it isn't molecular genetics versus behavior, behavioral genetics. Okay, so um, I'll talk this afternoon about um, the exciting stuff that's happening in molecular genetics, and it really is amazing if you think about the century where the word wasn't gene, gene wasn't even in, coined until 1903, and then 50 years for the structure of DNA, 50 more years sequenced the whole genome, and now genome-wide association studies, which you've heard a little bit about, you know, is taking over, and then people are now pausing, waiting for sequencing. So it makes you really wonder what's going to happen 50 years from now. But what's clear is molecular genetics is with us. And I was really um, struck by this because I wrote what I think was the first paper in developmental psychology about molecular genetics in 98. And now I'm doing a follow-up. I've done a follow-up 13 years later, and it's really amazing how things have changed. It's just a totally different world, even in those 13 years. Microarrays weren't invented then. Genome-wide association, people, there was only a paper saying that might be possible one day, and then whole genome sequencing, you know, was thought to be impossible. And the human genome sequence was sequenced, um, what, in 2003 for 20 billion pounds and 2,000 investigators, you know, so the idea that we're just going to all have sequence data seemed impossible. So um, this is just a recent summary, which I'll talk about this afternoon, about genome-wide significance for 200 traits in over 1,000 published GWAS studies. So, you know, this is really, I think, one of the biggest changes in science. And you can't read that, and you can't read that. These are the 210 traits, but here are a few of those traits that would interest people in this audience. So it's starting to happen, but what I'll talk about mostly this afternoon is we're not just looking for one big needle in a haystack but rather lots of very little effects. And so I think most people agree, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, it says um, what we're looking for are many genes of very small effect size. And we could talk about those as quantitative trait loci. So molecular genetics is, I think, probably the fastest moving area of science ever. I mean, I don't know, maybe people would disagree, but it really is incredibly fast moving. And what have we actually learned, though, about complex traits? I think we've learned of something extremely important and that is that we're talking about many genes of very small effect size. The studies are large enough, it's hard to find the genes, but the studies have tremendous power to prove that there are no big effects, period. And I do think, though, that in the next few years we're going to have DNA chips that will account for a significant, but we don't know how, how much, of the heritability. But I think it's probably going to be a small amount of variance in that it'll be useful in research, we will use it in our research, but it's probably not going to have enough predictive power to be useful clinically. Those are just my, that's sort of what I'll talk about this afternoon, but what about quantitative genetics, though? I mean, why do it in a molecular genetic age? And um, I'm using the uh, Aesop fable here of the tortoise and the hare, um, the uh, hare representing molecular genetics and the tortoise being quantitative genetics. And this, in this paper that uh, Claire Howarth and I have published last year, there are three things that I think, uh, Tim alluded to these, but um, it's really important to emphasize them, that quantitative genetics can estimate the uh, cumulative effect of genetic influence, regardless of the number of genes involved or the complexity. And as we get into the molecular genetics, each of those clauses becomes incredibly important, because that's where we're getting hung up on the molecular genetic side. And then, just as importantly for me, molecular genetics doesn't study the environment in itself. You can include environmental measures, but 
intrinsically quantitative genetic studies are just as much studies of the environment as they are of genetics. And then thirdly, quantitative genetics isn't just asking about heritability. As you saw from the previous talks, most of the interesting questions go beyond simply asking about heritability. And what we found from the heritability studies, though, is that genetic influence is significant and substantial for nearly all behavioral traits. Think about how things have changed. I mean, it was 20 years ago, you'd have to argue something's heritable. But is there anything anyone can reliably show no heritability for? I mean, Dorrit, was it, showed religious um, activities, you know, that's even a tricky one. And religiosity is heritable, but maybe specific activities of how much you go to church isn't. So, it's real, so it's, that's an important finding, but just as important is that it provides what I think is the best available evidence for the importance of the environment. And that shouldn't be taken lightly, because if you realize how important genetic is, important genetics is, so many of the studies, you know, that have um, uh, supposedly been environmental studies are completely confounded. And so um, we... Uh, anyway, I often get trotted out now in psychiatric circles to be an environmentalist because people say, oh, schizophrenia is a genetic disease. It isn't. You know, 50% concordance isn't 100% concordance. Breast cancer, well, I'll talk about that this afternoon. Um, and you can go beyond heritability estimates. So I'm going to talk about not five examples of methods you could use, which is what Tim was talking about more, but five examples of what I think are really important findings that have come out of quantitative genetics, the first being one that people have alluded to. Shared environment isn't important, yet our theories, environmental theories, are shared environmental theories. So, so this is what I'll talk about this afternoon, so I won't go into it detail now. Environmental measures are heritable. I think that's a mind-boggling finding. You, it's hard to find in measures of the environment that don't show significant heritability. Heritability increases during development. Tim alluded to that. That's good because it's counterintuitive. You know, if you ask people about it, they think environment, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune build up, up during development, so heritability goes down. It doesn't. When heritability changes, as it does for IQ, it goes up. Common disorders are quantitative traits. That takes a little bit of explanation, but I think it's a tremendously important finding. And then the topic of my talk this morning, which I'm just going to talk about very, very briefly. Genes are generalists. And um, so this is maybe a little bit more esoteric, but I think it is very important. You heard several talks already today suggesting that genetic effects seem to be quite general. And in the area of cognition, I think they really are. So instead of studying the variance of one trait like reading and then doing a genetic analysis of another trait like math, multivariate genetic analysis allows you to look at, analyze the covariance between traits, asking the extent to which the same genes are involved. So several of the previous talks were about this. So the new concept, though, is a genetic correlation, which is the extent to which genetic variation here correlates, literally correlates with genetic variation there. And the most stunning finding I've come up with, I think, I mean, that interests me the most, is that despite the cognitive process differences in reading and math, they're both substantially heritable, but the genetic correlation is 0.8. That means 80% of the genetic variance covariates. That means if you found a gene for reading, there's like an 80% chance it's a gene for math. So I think that's tremendously important. It's not 100%. There's, you know, math-specific, reading-specific. But I think what the multivariate genetic analyses are telling us, not just for reading and math, but for all sorts of language and cognition, is Sebastian here. I'm going to embarrass him by saying that, I, you know, executive function, I think, you know, correlates very highly with uh, these cognitive variables as well. So it does seem that in the whole cognitive realm, most of the genetic variance is general. Here's our most recent paper, a latent variable analysis with multiple measures of reading, math, and language. And here are the genetic correlations. A, in case some people were puzzled, the ACE model, A, is additive genetic influence. The correlations are very high, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, between math and language, you know, which seem two very different traits and between reading and language. And then you ask about G, general cognitive ability, the genetic correlations are even higher. So it does suggest, although there are, you know, um, ability-specific measures, the, the story here that's really amazing to me is that gene genetic effects tend to be very general, and what makes things different is environment. And so there are genes uh, specific to abilities, but most of the genes affect uh, most cognitive abilities. And this is a paper in Psych Bulletin that Yulia Kovas and I have. And I think it has major implications for psychology, neuroscience, molecular genetics. 
But just in terms of neuroscience, the first thing that people think about when you say generalist genes is that there's one process, either a physical process like dendritic density or a physiological process like synaptic plasticity or um, a cognitive process like executive function. So there's one fundamental process, but that certainly doesn't need to be the explanation, right? Most neuroscientists, if they think about it, with their modularity, believe that there are genetically independent processes, but each of those processes then affect each and many of these psychological traits, so that the generalist genes are only out here at the behavior, and that there are these modular, independent neural processes driven by different genes. There aren't data about this, but I bet a whole lot of money, it's much more like this, that genes are generalists at the level of the brain, as well as the mind, as well as behavior. So it's empirical, but I'm just saying that genes, a fundamental two processes about genes, they're pleiotropic. One gene affects many traits, and they're polygenic in the sense that any trait is affected by many genes. And so I think you put those together, and there's generalist genes in the brain as well as in behaviors. So just to close, um, most, this is sort of a pitch for quantitative genetics, obviously, but most of what we know about genetics and behavior I th comes from quantitative genetics. And that there, and this is the point of Tim's talk as well, there's a lot more to be learned. It's not all over. In fact, we're just beginning to realize how valuable it is and the questions we can ask. So with all of that, I hope you can see the um, moral to the Aesop fable that I'll talk about this afternoon. Good, thank you.